When one attains bliss, then he acts. Without attaining bliss, he does not act. Only on attaining bliss does one act. But bliss itself should be sought to be understood. Revered sir, I wish to understand bliss. Bhashya The said acting also comes about only when one attains bliss. That is, when he makes up his mind to the effect that the highest bliss going to be described has to be attained by me. Just as in the case of actions which are actually found to result in bliss, happiness, so in the case in question also. Without attaining bliss, one does not act. Though it is the future result that is meant here by the attaining bliss, yet it is spoken of as in the past, by the past participle having attained, as it is only the future result sought to be secured by the proposed activity, with a view to which the said action is taken up. At this stage, some people may have the notion that when the items beginning with action are accomplished, the true becomes manifested by itself, so that no separate effect need be put forth for understanding it. In anticipation of such a notion, it has been added, bliss itself should be sought to be understood, etc. Revered Sir, I wish to understand bliss. When Narada had thus become duly attentive, Sanat Kumara said to him as follows, That which is infinite is bliss. There is no bliss in what is finite. The infinite alone is bliss. But the infinite itself should be sought to be understood. Revered Sir, I wish to understand the infinite. Bhashya That which is infinite, large, unexcelled, highest, much, all these are synonyms, and this is bliss. What is less than the infinite is excelled by this latter. Hence it is called finite, small. Hence, in what is finite there is no bliss, because the finite, or the small, always gives rise to longing for what is more than that, and all longing is a source of pain. And in the world it has been found that what is a source of pain, such as fever and other diseases, is not bliss. Hence, it is quite correct to say that there is no bliss in what is finite, Hence, the infinite alone is bliss, especially because in the infinite there is no possibility of any sources of pain like longing and the rest. Wherein one sees nothing else, hears nothing else, and understands nothing else, that is the infinite wherein one sees something else, hears something else, and understands something else, that is finite. That which is infinite is immortal. That which is finite is mortal. Revered sir, wherein does that rest? In its own majesty, or not in majesty? Bhashya he explains what the distinguishing character of the infinite is, wherein, in which infinite, as an entity, the seer does not see anything else, which is to be seen by means of other sense organs, as distinct from the seer himself. Similarly, one hears nothing else, inasmuch as name and form alone are meant to be included here, the text mentions only the apprehensions of those alone in the shape of seeing and hearing, and the others being mentioned as merely illustratives. 
But reflection should be understood to be included here by some such expression as when one reflects upon nothing else, as understanding is almost invariably preceded by reflection. Similarly, when one understands nothing else, that which has this character is the infinite. Objection. Is it the absence of the seeing of other well-known things that is denied in reference to the infinite by the expressions, one sees nothing else and the rest? Or is it meant that he sees himself nothing else? That is, does the sentence mean merely the denial of the seeing of other well-known things, or the affirmative of the man seeing himself and nothing else? The Advaitin says, what difference would that make? The objection continues, if what is asserted is only the absence of the seeing of other things, then the sense comes to be that the infinite is something entirely different in character from all notions involving duality. If, on the other hand, what is meant by the denial of the seeing of other is that one sees himself, then it would mean the admission of the distinction between action, seeing, acting agent, seer, and the result, perception. What would be the harm if this were so admitted? Yudwaitan replies, The harm would be that there would be no cessation of the cycle of births and deaths, as this cycle consists in the said distinction between action, actor, and its result. The objector continues, But under the doctrine of the unity of the self, the distinction between action, actor, and result is entirely different in character from that involved in the cycle of births and deaths. Hudwaitan, not so. If the unity of the self is held to be free from all distinction and diversity, the idea of the distinction between the action of seeing, etc., the actor, and the result is merely verbal. Even under the view that what is meant is the negation of the seeing of anything else, the very distinctions involved in the terms wherein and sees nothing else would be meaningless. The objector says, In the ordinary world, it is found that in an empty room, when it is said that one sees no one else, it is not meant that the man's own self or the pillars and other things are not seen, it means only that no other person is seen. So it would be in the case in question also. Yudwaitan replies, Not so. Inasmuch as absolute unity has been taught in the text that thou art, there is no possibility of any such distinction as between the container and the contained, as is involved in the qualifications wherein and nothing else, Further, under Discourse 6, it has been established that being alone is true one without a second. And in accordance with the following texts, the perception of the self by itself is not possible. A. Invisible, not self, etc. Taitariya 271. B. Its form is not within the range of vision. Katupanishad 6.9. C. By what could one know the knower? Vihadaranyakopanishad 2.4.14. Objection. In that case, the qualifying term wherein becomes meaningless. Adwaitan. No. It is in reference to distinctions based upon nescience, ignorance. In the text, being, one without a second, is found that though being is really incapable of numerical qualification, as expressed by the term one, yet it is spoken of in that way in reference to those notions of truth, unity, and secondless, as have been dealt with in the context in which the said text, being, one, secondless, occurs. In the same manner, Though the infinite is one only, 
yet the qualification of wherein has been applied to it in reference to what is spoken of in the context. Further, when the text applies to the infinite, the qualification involved in the phrase sees nothing else, which implies distinction, what it does is to make a reference to the seeing of others during the normal state of ignorance and then to deny that seeing of others in regard to the infinite. Thus, the upshot of the whole context is that the process of births and deaths is not applicable to the infinite, which is beyond the reach of that process.